Funding for this edition of Think Tank with Steve Adubato has been provided by RWJ Barnabas Health, the Northward Center, Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, New Jersey Sharing Network, dedicated to saving lives through organ and tissue donation, the New Jersey Education Association, PSENG, committed to providing safe, reliable energy now and in the future. The Russell Berry Foundation, making a difference. The law firm of Gibbons PC. And by Adler Aphasia Center, offering therapeutic programming for stroke and brain injury survivors with aphasia. Promotional support provided by NJ.com, small news, big news, true Jersey. And by Jaffe Communications, supporting our state's innovators and change makers with public relations, creative services, and more. Welcome to Think Tank. I'm Steve Adubato. One of the most important conversations I'm sure we, were ever, we will ever have on this program on white supremacy, on the history of race, on racism, and what we need to do to begin to move things in our country in a more positive direction. You could not have a better panel to do this. Here they are. Warren Siegel is director of the Center on Extremism at the Anti-Defamation League. Walter Fields, it's been a while since he's been with us, but he's a great friend. He's the executive editor of NorthStarNews.com and chairman of Black Parents Workshop. Elise Body is professor at Rutgers Law School and a civil rights expert. And finally, Linda, Linda Gordon is university professor of history at New York University and the author of The Second Coming of the KKK, the Ku Klux Klan in the 1920s, and the American political tradition. I want to thank you all for joining us on Think Tank. Walter, it's been a lot of years since you and I have talked about race in this country. Today, as we tape this program at the end of 2019, how bad is the racial divide in our country today, A, and B, how much of that has to do with the current climate in the White House? Well, I certainly think it's bad. <clears throat> I don't think it's the worst we've ever seen, but I think it's bad. And I think the occupant of the Oval Office has made things worse by stirring the pot a bit. How so? Well, I think his use of language, I think his use of uh, stereotyping, characterizing certain groups in this country as illegitimate, as un-American, has contributed to this climate of hate that we see across the country. Would it be there anyway? Oh, it would definitely be there anyway. But I think people feel more comfortable if they see people in positions of power articulating a view that they may have felt but never said themselves publicly. So let me flip this a little bit. If, if Hillary Clinton were, in fact, president and she had won that election in the Electoral College as well as the popular vote, but won it straight up, would, be where we, or would we be where we are today in terms of the polarization, the divide, the intensity of what appears to be some pretty negative feelings about folks? Well, I think the discourse would be different, and I think that's what Walter was alluding to, the fact that we now have a president who just openly traffics in white supremacy and, and hate and is, you know... Could you give an example of that? Well, I mean, we, you know, on the campaign trail, he, you know, was talking about Mexican judges, and he has, you know, on the, the southern border... He was talking about a judge who happened to be Mexican who could not, in fact, rule on a case involving him, uh, Donald Trump, because of his Mexican heritage and what the president had said about... Mexican illegal immigrants. That was, I believe, his logic. Yeah, I mean, he's just used, he's been overtly racist and un unapologetically so. I think when we look at what's happened on the southern border, he has sort of demonized brown people at the border. Um, we have, of course, the incident in Charlottesville when he said we have, you know, good people on both sides of this issue. How important issue. was that? I think it was extremely important. I mean, I, you know, he legitimized, uh, I mean, open, aggressive hate um, when we have a, you know, an incident where a woman was killed uh, by, you know, someone... By that car that just rammed into that crowd. Into that crowd. I mean, it, so that was certainly, um, I wouldn't say it was the opening salvo for Was there a the seminal president. moment in terms of our race relations in this country? A seminal moment in this presidency? As it relates to race, white supremacy, and being where we need to be versus where we are. 
Was it a seminal moment? I think Charlottesville was a seminal moment, but the problem is there's so many to choose from now. I mean, where do you, I, you know, I, I've, I've almost forgotten all the different yeah. incidents of overt racism. That take, take, sorry for interrupting. Take a yeah. step back. If we were, who could take a shot at defining, by the way, there are going to be people who watch this show, and my sense is they're going to say, Adubato's doing a program on public television that's blaming racism and white supremacy um, and white nationalism on the president. You can think what you want. We don't have an opinion. We're bringing people together who understand this issue, who tackle this issue from a variety of perspectives. They are sharing their views. We look forward to hearing yours, and our website will be up there in just a moment. White supremacy is defined as? Take sure. a shot. So <clears throat> it depends on which white supremacist group, but overall, white supremacists believe that they want to create a white ethno state in this country, and it's at the expense of a range of minorities in this country. It's basically whites first. Linda, you've been studying this for a long time. White supremacy versus white, quote, nationalism, the difference? Well, the white nationalists actually have, theoretically, I'm not really convinced of it, a notion that they can have a separate nation. But, you know, I often use the word bigotry because I think there's a long tradition of this. And I also, you know, one of the best uh, collectors of data is the Southern Poverty Law Center. And what they are showing is an increase of what get to be called hate crimes. I don't like that term, but against a whole range of groups. And, but all of it, I think all of it strengthens the other part. And I think it's even strengthened by Trump talking about, quote, shithole nations, because it's quite clear that the nations he's talking about are nations primarily of people of color. But to play devil's advocate, there will be those who are watching and those who believe that the president was simply attempting to talk about the problem of illegal immigration in this nation and stopping the flow of those who come into this country illegally. And he happened to use that language, but it was not, in the eyes of some, racially motivated. Take a shot. Well, I think you'd be blinded from the truth if that's what you really thought he was doing. I mean, we've always had a problem with immigration in this country, how to control it, how to manage it. So that's nothing new. And we don't really well, have... Excuse me, my grandparents came here in the 19... 20s, it was an issue then as well for Italians Absolutely. who were coming here and so many Absolutely. other groups. But go ahead. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's always been an issue. Uh, <laughs> we don't have an illegal immigration crisis as this president attempted to suggest. It was a manufactured crisis because it played to a part of his base. And so when we start talking about white supremacy, you can't talk about it absent a real conversation about institutions in this country and the birth of this nation and how it was embedded pretty much throughout society. And so when you start talking about white supremacy, I always define it as the use of skin color to define human value. So black skin was devalued from day one in the United States, and we've seen that permeate through institutions, and we've seen it embedded into law. Our challenge today is to unpack that in a country where we seldom want to get to the heart of these matters. We talk around them. But we never want to get to the heart of the What's issue. What's at the heart of the world? The heart of the issue is that we have defined worth based upon skin color. And black and brown people have been devalued in this country. So if you're talking to groups of people who have no contact with black or brown people, they believe that narrative. The irony is that, you know, when you look back historically, and people always look back to the civil rights movement, you know, the war on poverty wasn't really about black people, it was about white people in Appalachia, because you had a president who saw, in Appalachia. who saw economic divides as tearing this country apart. Right. Unfortunately, the narrative has been construed to suggest that black and brown people have been a burden on this nation's economy, and we haven't. But, but complicated anymore, by the way, you're making reference to uh, Lyndon Johnson and the war yes. on poverty in Appalachia, and uh, a lot of poor folks happen to be there, but go ahead. Well, I just wanted to jump in here because I think, and, and <clears throat> you, were, you were going in this direction earlier, I think it's important not to get too distracted by this president. I think what Walter mm -hmm. distracted is... Distracted by? Well, well, the the fact of the matter is... He's a leader of the free world. Well, it's he... First of all, it's important to understand that he is driving very toxic discourse in this country and dangerous discourse. But I think, to Walter's point, we have... Part of white supremacy in this country is tolerating... Um, grievous levels of <clears throat> racial inequality. In the state of New Jersey, we have 270,000 black and Latino children who are in rac racially isolated high poverty schools. We have a median black wealth, which is 12 times less than white median wealth. We have high levels of incarceration. 
And these are, these are examples of institutions that drive very severe racial inequality, and we tolerate that. And I think that is, it's not white supremacy in the but sense racism, of, Excuse me, yeah. racism is the reason for all of that? Racism is a systemic oppression of people of color, and that is those but, are but forms of let, oppression. Let me, let me try. Yes, 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 because I'm, I'm going to ask a question about there are many people who are watching this program, and many friends of mine, who voted for Donald Trump, like Donald Trump, and say that none of the reason they like him has to do with any of the things you've talked about right now. So we're going to try to put that on the table mm -hmm. as well, because where are they coming from? Go ahead. I'm sorry, doctor. I, I just want to throw out a couple of pieces of data sure. about immigration. There's been created a kind of panic about the large-scale immigration. But, you know, you mentioned your parents came here in the 1920s. My grandparents came here. My parents right. came here then as well. That immigration was three times greater proportionally than what we have seen in the last decade. So what's driving this? This, it's what's driving it is where these people are coming from. Right? And that's why I completely <clears throat> agree that there the is a, their a racist subtext when people are angry about immigration, and, and that hap we saw that happening in, in Britain and behind the Brexit thing. So it's not just an American it's problem. It's around the world. Yes, and by the way, Walter talked about people who are black and brown, but there are those who happen to be Jewish who are targets of white supremacy as well. Yeah. When you look at the deadliest mass shooting against the Jewish community in American history, we're coming up on that anniversary. We've also seen shootings against the Hispanic community, the African American community, the immigrant community. These are the all gay happened, community. but these have all happened in a period of one year. And in part, yes, it's the public discussion, it's divisive. We have to hold the people in the highest office accountable. But we also have to understand what is animating individual white supremacists. What is it? And that, uh, in, in many ways, is the ability to reach, recruit, and radicalize online, finding like-minded communities, and we can't forget, whether they're right or wrong, people in the white community, especially young white men, feel alienated. And they're going to try to find stereotypes and people to explain away their lot in life. And when you have an online environment Social that media is has contributed to, people, to white nationalism, white supremacy, and racism? A hundred percent. When you are able to find a like-minded community, a sense of belonging in anti-Semitic, racist, and, hide. and tropes, and oftentimes you can hide if you want to. Yes. It creates a feeling where you never have to leave your parents' basement, and yet you can be part of a larger global movement. Are you accountable for your actions to the same degree that you would if there were not social media being as dominant as it is? Of course. We hold the people so. who carry out these attacks accountable, but we have to understand the environment in which they feel emboldened. And we have data on that as well. When you look at white supremacist propaganda in this country in the past three years, it has tripled from 2016 to 2019. FBI hate crime data. Uh, ADL's anti-Semitic incidents. We are seeing a rise in league. all of these right. activities. Right. I'm going to set this up before we go sure. to the break. Significant number of folks who I know, who watch this program, who are fans of public broadcasting, who I know voted for Donald Trump. And when I talk to them about these issues, not having to do with politics, not having to do with tax policy, but talking about human decency toward other people, particularly for those of us who are Italian-American whose forefathers and foremothers came here from another country and were treated in a certain way, long story short, and we expect, expected for them and for others to be treated decently. A lot of friends of mine, a lot of folks will say that's not the issue. I like them for other reasons. I'm going to ask the question, how accountable are they for what we're talking about? This is Think Tank. I'm Steve Adubato. I'll be right back. To watch more Think Tank with Steve Adubato, find us online and follow us on social media. This is Think Tank. I'm Steve Adubato. We're talking about race, white supremacy, a whole range of related issues. Walter, let me ask you. You heard what I said when we went out to the break. It's not just, forget about my friends. There are a lot of people who say, I vote for Trump. Yes, I don't like the thing he said about asshole countries. I don't like the thing he said about Mexicans when he came down uh, that escalator, if you will. I don't like a lot of things Trump says about the Mexican judge, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but you know what? Like his tax policies. It's been good for me, you say. Are they contributing to what we are talking about, or can they bifurcate or separate that? I don't think you can bifurcate <clears throat> hate. And so even if you support his tax policy, if you see the leader of this country contributing to this hateful environment that we're now engulfed in, you're also responsible, because as an American citizen, you should be able to stand on truth. You know, one of the things that's driving the insecurity in this country is the demographic change. And it's clear that particularly for white males... Fewer whites and more people fewer, of color? Fewer whites, more people of color. 
the white birth rate has declined, and I think certain politicians have contributed to that panic. And so when you look at that, you begin to understand that even if you are a benign supporter of someone like a Donald Trump... Actually, they disagree with a lot of the things the president says about race. But, but not... you're saying they're still contributing to Absolutely, this. Absolutely, because if they're not voicing that disagreement, disagreement in silence means nothing, right? So no matter who you support as a politician, you should have the moral integrity that if you see that person contributing to the fracturing of this nation, yeah. it's your responsibility to speak but, up. But as, as we do this program, and I know we don't try to be timely at all, that's the job of NJTV News every night, the president literally said just this week as we're doing this program that what is happening to him in this impeachment process, that he is being, quote, lynched. <laughs> Doctor. Well, it's a disgraceful, a disgraceful statement. Is it relevant to this discussion right it, now? It is relevant to this discussion, and it harks back to when uh, um, Clarence, Clarence Thomas, Thomas says spoke this is a high tech about, lynching. About lynching. I believe and it was in the early 1990s. It's a way of diminishing the, uh, the, the viciousness and the almost genocidal quality. But of let what me lynching just point really out, was and is. Well, let me just point out one other thing about. Related to what Walter said, you know, I think the bottom line here is inequality. But and one of the things that goes on in this kind of situation is a, a tendency of people on the right, when they want to blame someone for their problems, <clears throat> they blame the people who are less advantaged. They don't turn that upward to look at the economic policies of the government, the foreign policy policies of the government. That is also a part of this, this tendency to really scapegoat, in this case, immigrants, for example, who happen to be largely these days. But the, the, the immigrants, and then there was our Af African Americans in the South and in Newark and in Jersey City and in Brooklyn and other places. That's not, they were born here. Mm -hmm. They were born here. So we're yes. not always talking about immigrants. I don't even want to get back in. Well, I just, I mean, I think that the, <clears throat> what, what the president said yesterday was just. As we're doing this program, the lynching comment. Go ahead. Well, I'm it sorry. was, it was. I, you know, there's no bottom with this president. The idea what do you that, mean by that, well, because the idea that he would compare the political process of impeachment to, to lynching, lynch. which is in the had, Constitution. Well, well, but also just even putting that to one side, we had thousands of African Americans who were lynched in this country. Walter referenced it. Um, earlier with respect to one of his um, family members. I had a grandmother who saw someone who was lynched in Arkansas. I mean, that was a level of violence that was committed against African Americans in this country because they deviated in some way from That's the right. social order, right? They violated the norms. Or they're accused of looking, they, at, a white or white looking woman. at a white woman. The, right, the Emmett Till, you know, Emmett Till. memorial, which is behind a Look bulletproof Look up Emmett Till, you'll cave. get the point of this. Go ahead. But so for this president to compare that process to the extraordinary level of violence that was visited upon African Americans throughout the South and other parts of this country, it is just, it is beyond reprehensible. But let me ask you this. What about folks who are watching us right now saying, Steve, you said this program is about race, race relations, white supremacy, white nationalism in the country, and 90% has been about Trump. Right. And so, so we're, 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 I'll come back to you. Walter. Go ahead. I, I got to say, words have consequences, and we need, even when uh, we agree with certain elements of an elected candidate, to hold them accountable for the days that they are at their worst. And it matters because we saw misogyny increase during the presidential campaign, uh, anti-immigrant rhetoric, anti-Muslim rhetoric, and at the end of the day, in Charlottesville, it was the Jews will not replace us. So we Remind see, folks what was being chanted by those who were marching that night. They were chanting, the Jews will not replace us, meaning that white supremacists have this narrative where immigration, whether it's Muslim immigration, uh, Mexican immigration, is actually controlled by the Jews. And so we have to re recognize that hatred against one is actually hatred against all. So when someone says, that's not me, it's not my problem, it's not me that they're targeting, but you, know, you I say... I think there is a problem with focusing too much on Trump. Because I, I, I totally agree, but I think we are have, being distracted from the policies. We have got policies that are tossing people out of food stamps, tossing children out of Medicaid. I, mean, I could go on at length. And this is contributing to these levels of inequality that create, or at least provide a, a comfort level for I'm just trying to deal with and rhetoric and right government. now and, and the impact right. of that rhetoric yeah. on people's actions, because there appears to be, we just had the attorney general in the state of New Jersey uh, on who talked to us, there's an increase in hate crimes. There is. is there a correlation, Walter Fields, in your mind, with the rhetoric, and I respect what you're saying about the policy is relevant, and we'll continue that conversation on another think tank. Do you see a correlation, a clear correlation between the the heightened rhetoric, the cruel, nasty words, the language being used about the other, 
and hate crimes. Oh, absolutely. I, I just did a panel with the Attorney General on uh, two nights ago. It was and, covered by NJTV right, News. Check and, it out. And we talked about that. But, but I, too, want to take it off the spotlight off Donald Trump. Because, Where should it be? Well, it should be on this country and the country that we created. So if you go back to 1776 and if you go back to 1787, the Constitution, you know, it was embedded in our nation's you know, most fundamental document that black people were three-fifths of that of a white person, right? So this notion of white supremacy has been permanently embedded in the culture of America. And so I think when we keep talking about Donald Trump, we miss the point, you know, because if we talk about Donald Trump, we got to talk about Woodrow Wilson. We got to talk about Thomas Jefferson. We got to talk, talk about, about George people who, Washington. who either own slaves or... Absolutely. Slaves. But, but, Walter, respectfully, let me ask you this. Do you think that in any way, I mean, I respect what you're saying because mm -hmm. it's not your opinion, it's, it's a fact, about three-fifths mm -hmm. of a man. There are those who are watching who are not race baiters, who are wi not white nationalists, who are not racists, who are sitting there going, Walter Fields, you're uh, someone who I'm following. I may not agree with everything you're saying. But they're saying Barack Obama was president in this nation, and that never could have happened at a different time. And has that not changed anything? Does that say anything about how many whites voted for Barack Obama? Does that, yes, that history is correct. Mm -hmm. But is that where we are? Sure, sure it's, it says a lot. But it also says that at 250, not even 250 years old, this country still has a lot of maturing. And so, yes, the election of Barack Obama was a seminal moment, but it was certainly just a moment. It wasn't the ultimate victory in terms of resolving the differences we have in this country. Go ahead. Can I jump in here? Because, look, I think it's important to acknowledge that we've had progress. Clearly, we've had progress. Um, in terms of well, racial we a, equality. We had a, yeah, we had, you know, we had a black president. Things have gotten better. We're not, you know, in the 1900s or the 18, you know, 60s anymore. Um, so there's been, there has been some progress. Um, and we do know that there are, uh, there are voters, white voters, who voted for... Barack Obama, who have voted for Trump. Yes. So there is some level of uh, economic anxiety in that, in that uh, situation. But I think to the question that you posed, sort of the problem with the rhetoric is that it, it normalizes racism, it normalizes hatred and of violence. the other, and violence. And so the problem is when you continue to hear over and over again, this very racist rhetoric, rhetoric people become numb to it, and, the, and you know because they're so used to hearing it. And the and the difficulty with that is that when you have people, you know, like the, the sort of the people who are watching this show who say, "Well, that's not me. I'm supporting Trump for other reasons." Well, if you're voting for Trump, you are enabling this president and that rhetoric, as far as I'm concerned. And so you can't. It is a luxury and a privilege to say, "I well, that doesn't affect me, so I'm not." You know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not incentivized. That's not me. But That's look, not me. Quick comment, because I'm going to ask this question. Who the heck is signing up to be part of these white nationalist, uh, white mm -hmm. supremacist groups? I'm curious about that, but go ahead. Right, so I think we have to understand white supremacy and those who uh, engage in violence is not part of groups always. Um, you know, most extremists right. are actually not part of an organized movement some or group. Some of those group. folks who, excuse me for interrupting, some of the folks who have done some of these mass shootings were not part of a group. The majority of them are certainly egged on online. They certainly find community online, but they're not card-carrying members of any group. So we right. have to understand that when we talk about the normalization of hate, there's the public discussion, but then there's the places that people spend most of their time, which is online. And when you look at the age of those who are engaged in white supremacy, they're increasingly getting younger. Younger. And so, you know, they're spending more and more of their time online. So, yes, we have to talk about the public discussion, but we have to talk about where people are actually spending their time. Let me ask you this. Is there anything to say to white folks out there, particularly white younger, I'm going to say men right now, for argument's sake, younger white men who feel that they are not as privileged as some think they are and that they are fighting an uphill battle and economically they are afraid, they are concerned, and they don't necessarily blame it on those who are other, but they don't know who the heck to blame it on. That Go is ahead. where the Talk issue of them. the policies come in. Even the Wall Street Journal is telling us about the absolutely astronomic increase in economic inequality in this country and the problems that that creates. We're also in a period of, in which we have tremendous deindustrialization that has cost people jobs. But the, one of the side effects of that is the 
incredible uh, battle anxiety. against unions, which were the only groups that kept working class people at a, at a salary okay, level I, I, that were I appreciate a the larger social salary. issue, but in terms of race, well, that anxiety I, causes a couple comments before well, I have I to go, the, Walter, the, go. The anxiety is rooted in racism. Oh, right. Walter, the anxiety, the legitimate, the, respectfully. The anxiety is rooted in racism. Why would, why would a Tim McVeigh who served in the United States Army. I'm not States talking Army. about the Tim McVeigh's of the world. But Tim McVeigh was a normal guy. He wouldn't belong to a group. He right? wasn't a normal guy. He was a guy who blew up a building and killed hundreds but of he, people. But he How was, was he a normal he guy? He was a normal white male who didn't belong to a white supremacist group but harbored these sentiments. Why does he harbor these sentiments? You don't think he's an average white guy, do you? I think there are a lot of Tim McVeigh's out there. But and so when you start talking about the anxiety, you can't get away from the issue of race because that you, you economic... Don't, you don't acknowledge the anxiety at all. Like, you literally no, are saying, I, I know I, I have to go to a close, I but it seems to me you're saying that if someone feels anxious and they have that anxiety, must be rooted in race, as opposed to they just feel anxiety. But why do they feel anxiety? They feel anxiety because they feel as though other people are getting advantages over them. And that's not true. But can I say, but I think, few seconds, go. I think it's important to acknowledge that throughout this country's history, there have been policies that have been handed down by people in power that have intentionally divided poor Absolutely. white people and, mm -hmm. and people Absolutely. of color. And so that, that anxiety, to Walter's point, it is rooted in a fear of you know, the other that is stoked this. by people in power. I know that we have barely scratched the surface, but I cannot thank all of you enough for being here. And I promise you, we'll come. I know people say this all the time. Let's come back and continue this conversation. Thank you. Thank you all. This has been Think Tank. I'm not going to do that whole read. I'm Steve Adubato. Thanks for watching. Make sure you think for yourself, particularly about the issue of race. See you next time. Think Tank with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation. Funding has been provided by RWJ Barnabas Health, the Northward Center, Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, New Jersey Sharing Network, the New Jersey Education Association, PSENG. The Russell Berry Foundation, the law firm of Gibbons, PC, and by Adler Aphasia Center. Promotional support provided by NJ.com and by Jaffe Communications. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. PSENG is building New Jersey's clean energy future. We're working to protect our network against extreme weather expanding and upgrading transmission lines, and modernizing our natural gas system by installing new, more durable underground pipes. At PSE&G, our goal is to make sure you have the safe, reliable energy you need to power your life now and into the future.